Hey, welcome to Equippers Church Sermon of the Week. My name is John Sparrow. I'm the lead pastor here at Equippers Church, and I'm thrilled you're tuning in. I believe the message you're about to hear is going to encourage you, inspire you, and equip you for life. If you'd like to know more about Equippers Church and ways to partner with us, please visit equipperscc.com. God bless. I'm going to speak uh, on the idea of you first. You first, putting others before ourselves, and specifically in the area of generosity. I'm going to talk about money today, and if that just made you cringe on the inside, Christianity must not be the thing, Um, because there's 50 verses in the Bible about faith, there's 50 verses in the Bible about prayer, over 2,000 scriptures and references to money. 16 of the 38 parables that Jesus tells are attached to money. Isn't that crazy? Why money? We'll get to it in a minute, but in Matthew chapter 6, it says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And man, do we need that ever more than right now in this moment in history where the world is motivated by greed. It's causing wars and rumors of wars, and it's causing people to do things really dramatic and outside of their character because they're hungry to accumulate and build their own kingdom versus someone else's. And so I think it's more important ever than ever to talk about our treasure. Because as the body of Christ, we're different, aren't we? We don't wage war the, world, the way the world does. We're generous people. And I'm going to talk about that today. And so as a church, we, over the years, have done a, a vision offering. And uh, what a vision offering is, is just a time we set aside to give a, above and beyond what we normally would. And this is for new initiatives. This is for updates and upgrades. There's a very small amount of our budget that goes to uh, technical gear and, you know, things just improve the children's space, signage, things to make the Clark Center just feel more like home. And uh, so that was our original intention for the vision offering of 2019. Hey, we put a list together. These are some things that we want. These are some things that we need. Uh, I think if we go after it, we can really do something to make the Clark Center feel even more like home. And uh, because that's important. That is important. Atmosphere is everything. We, we spend money on sound and microphones and lighting and because we believe the atmosphere is really important. It's actually such a tool to encounter God himself. And I don't say that lightly. There's actually a lot of weight behind what I'm saying. You want to know why? I had dinner with Benny Hinn the other night. This is not a joke. And I, I was in L.A. It just so happened, don't worry, I'm not important. I just happened to be with a guy who was important. And, uh, and we're having a conversation at dinner in, in, of course, Beverly Hills, and it's just the weirdest thing I've ever experienced. And the, <laughs> but Benny Hinn, it was just a couple of us at a table for about three hours, and he started talking about atmosphere. And he attributes miracles, signs, wonders to atmosphere, to good sound, to excellence, people who care. He said, you have no clue what's going on behind the scenes to actually make an environment where people can encounter God. And I've always thought that since I was a little boy. When I was about, I was probably 12 or 14, I closed my eyes one day in worship at our old building and I saw uh, bars of lights and just an electric atmosphere environment. And uh, I just knew that God would call us to create environments, create atmosphere where people could encounter him aside from a message, aside from what song, just places of encounter. And uh, so that doesn't come from me, that comes from Benny Hinn people and you cannot argue that. (laughs) Um, atmosphere matters. So we, we were starting on all this vision stuff and putting lists together. What are some improvements we want to make and what do we want to do? We've done some of that already. We found some stashed funds from a vision offering in the past. And so we've, we've done some upgrades and improvements and we're going to go do an overhaul for the children to make them have a welcoming space. But look, we started the year in Joshua 1. And uh, we believed it was prophetic for our church. There was this message about taking new territory in Joshua chapter 1. Anyone been tracking with us for a little while? And it was amazing. It wasn't just us in this house. My friend Chad in Santa Maria, same thing. God gave him this vision uh, for his church out of Joshua 1. My brother-in-law in in Napomo, same thing. Without conversation, God had given his vision out of Joshua 1 for this year. And as we're preparing for the vision offering, I, I, I read this passage In Joshua chapter 1, it says this, Your wives, your children, and your livestock may stay in the land that Moses gave you east of the Jordan. But all your fighting men ready for battle must cross over ahead of your fellow Israelites. 
You are to help them until the Lord gives them rest, as he has done for you. And until they too have taken possession of the land that the Lord your God is giving them. After that, you may go back and occupy your own land, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you east of the Jordan toward the sunrise. There's this idea in Joshua 1 of a you-first mentality. There is the eastern tribes that Joshua is speaking to here that had, had been given a promise from Moses to occupy territory east of the Jordan. And so their inheritance necessarily wasn't on the other side, but what was required of them is for the rest of the tribes to take them on the journey across the Jordan, go with them. And only when they went with them, only when they sacrificed, only when they got out of their comfort zone and got other tribes across the Jordan would they be able to come back and inherit the very thing that God had promised. I was reading that. I thought, I don't want to walk into the next season of our church just ordinarily (laughs) or naturally. We could campaign. We could raise money. We could maybe get some lending from a commercial bank if we ever want to do a building project. We could probably do that ordinarily. We have things structured pretty well. I thought, man, I I just don't want to do it ordinarily. I don't want to do natural church. I, I, I don't know about you, but I want to do this supernaturally, <laughs> unordinarily. And so what we came up with for vision offering this year is like, hey, we're believing for supernatural things of provision for our church. But I think what's going to give us access to that and unlock that for our church is if we get a bunch of money and then we just give it to other people, <laughs> Like, I, I know other church plants and ministries in our area that don't have the privilege that we have. We don't, they, don't, they haven't entered into the rest yet that we have. Like, I, I know guys that I talk to sit across the table at, at coffee, and they're like, I don't know like, we're, we're, how we're going to eat next week, but I know God's called us to the Central Coast to plant a church. And I think we could devote ourselves to making sure that they get into their inheritance. I think as a church, we're not just blessed to be blessed. I think we're, we're blessed to be a blessing. Would you agree? I I believe we're called to be generous. I'm excited to be a part of what God's doing on the central coast of California. But I know that we're not the epicenter of it. We're not the only ones going after revival. I I met a guy from Kentucky. And uh, he has a wife and four children. Never been out here in his life. God spoke to him. He couldn't shake it. And they just moved out here on a word from the Lord. They're starting a church in San Luis. I'm really excited for them. They have no resource. They, they've got a few speakers in you know, the back of a car, and they find a place, and they gather at parks and things, and that's exciting. I, I just don't want them to do it alone. I want them to know that they're welcome on the Central Coast. More the merrier. And you know why I selflessly say that? Because selfishly, I know. Can you go with me here? Selfishly, I know that to access all God has for us as a church, we have to be generous to other churches. I think generosity has been misunderstood for a long time, and we'll get into that. It's like this idea of giving, you know, with no expectation. That's pretty. That's cute. (laughs) It's a good thought, but it's not the way the Bible works. I give to you with no expectation of you returning anything to me, totally, 100%. You take the shirt off my back, you take the shoes off my feet, and you appreciate these red shoes today. I feel like I'm like, my prophecy shoes today. (laughs) Burgundy. (laughs) Good morning, San Diego. Um, You don't catch that? It's these shoes, man. New balance. Okay, we're reading into it too much now. Thought about wearing an all-white suit and throwing my jacket around a bit this morning, but we're not quite there yet. Glory. What are we talking about? Generosity. Generosity. Giving. I give to you, and I don't expect you to do anything for me. Hands are clean. Hands are open. Please, don't, you don't owe me anything. But what I, what, when I am generous to you, 
When I give to you sacrificially, it activates something in heaven where it is required that I reap from that. I, I reap from what I sow. Not from you, but from my Father. And so, as a church, we're activating something in the Spirit as we choose to be generous. This vision offering is going to run from today through June 23rd, and I'll explain how to give and how to contribute, but we're not just giving money for giving money's sake. We're giving money to activate something in the heavenlies so that our church can be positioned to inherit all God has promised for us. But we're not trying to climb our own mountain and build our own kingdom. We believe that if we start serving others, that God will exalt us in the midst of it. Amen? Amen. I want, I want to speak into that principle out of Genesis chapter 14. Anybody have a Bible with them this morning? Physical Bible? Come on, somebody. Physical Bible, as if we're like better than anyone else. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> no. Um, to set the stage, Abram is uh, been hijacked by God himself. And he started this incredible progression in his life of journeying with God. And uh, we pick it up in, in chapter 14. And Abram's nephew Lot had been captured by an army. And so when Abram hears that his nephew had been captured, he sends out, it says, 318 trained men uh, that were of Abram's house, and they overthrew Kedorlaomer's, uh, what a name, army, until he caught them. And uh, I'm going to pick it up in verse 15. So Abram just went on a mission to rescue his nephew, and from that they receive plunder, if you will. There he divided his men and attacked during the night. This is 14, verse 15 in Genesis. Kedorlamor, his army fled, but Abram chased them as far as Hobah, north of Damascus. Abram recovered all the goods that had been taken, and he brought back his nephew Lot with his possessions and all the women and other captives. Going on to verse 17. After Abram returned from his victory over Kedorlamor, and all his allies, the king of Sodom, went out to meet him in the valley of Shiva, that is the king's valley. And Melchizedek, the king of Salem, and a priest of God Most High, brought Abram some bread and wine. Melchizedek blessed Abram with this blessing. Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has defeated your enemies for you. Here it is. Then Abram gave Melchizedek a tenth of all the goods he had recovered. The king of Sodom said to Abram, give back to my people who are captured, but you may keep for yourself all the goods you have recovered. Abram replied to the king of Sodom, I solemnly swear to the Lord God most high creator of heaven and earth that I will not take so much as a single thread or sandal from what belongs to you. Otherwise, you, may, you might say I am the one who made Abram rich. I will accept only what my young warriors have already eaten, and I request that you give a fair share of the goods to my allies, Anur, Eshkol, and Mamre. Mavre. What just happened was there was a king who represented Sodom and a king who represented Salem, and they approached Abram in two different ways. The king of Sodom went out to get from Abram something. The king of Salem, Melchizedek, invited Abram in, provided him wine and bread, and blessed him. And Abram responded to the inviting him in, feeding him, blessing him by giving him a tenth of all that he had plundered. Here's the thing. Abram was not obligated to give anything to Melchizedek. There was no obligation culturally to give anything to Melchizedek. But he saw something in Melchizedek that said, I want what you have to mark my life. Melchizedek's name means righteous one. And Salem was the place of peace. So he saw righteousness and peace and thought, that's the kingdom that I want to sow into and bless into. And check this out. As we keep reading into chapter 15, now Abram has an encounter with the Lord to receive his covenant promise. Not a coincidence, it came right after his generous act. Now, in verse 15, chapter 15, 
it says this, the Lord said to him, no, your servant will not be your heir. He's giving him a promise of children. Your, your inheritance will outnumber the uh, stars in the sky. And it says in verse 6, and Abram believed the Lord, and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. Here's the deal. Abraham sows into Melchizedek, whose name means righteousness. And just after that, God calls Abram righteous. Do you see what I'm getting at? That when we give in generosity, it doesn't just activate financial gain. It actually positions you in a spiritual way as well. Melchizedek sowed financially a tenth of what he had to Melchizedek. And God, through his filter, gave Abram the title of righteous. He considered him righteous. I mean, that matters a lot more than anything you could accumulate on the earth. That from an act of obedience, God would then say, my righteous one. And we'll get to what that, all that peace means as well. And so, as we go into three quick points, I, I want that to be our framework. That I'm not just talking financial. I'm not just talking about tithe, offering the nitty gritty Excel spreadsheet sort of stuff. I, I'm saying that our generosity is activating something in the heavenlies. Can you agree? Can I get an amen? It's activating a principle that God cannot revoke because he set it in motion decades, centuries, thousands of years ago. He set it in motion, and he's not going to revoke it, so we're going to tap into it as a church. Amen? Amen. There was a a, a board meeting. Look, I I hate board meetings. I just got to be totally honest. I'm on three... Actually, what's really exciting is being on the board for 17 Strong. That's really fun. Uh, We just talk about all the people we get to send on these victory trips, and if you don't know 17 Strong, please look into it. It's an amazing organization. Um, and so that's really fun. We talk about sending people on trips that have overcome and, and defeated life-threatening illnesses. And so that's a blast. Church board meetings, I'm sorry to the board. It's a lot of numbers. It's, it's a lot of things that uh, I have a lot more fun other places. So I'll just leave it at that. Come on, no offense. Um, and, and I left one board meeting. I just thought, hear, hear me out here. Uh, hear me out. I'm the lead pastor here. <laughs> and I want to operate my church as I operate my own life. Because that's integrity. And in my own life, if I want something, I give. <laughs> and in my own life, and we're planning for the future, and, you know, we want to have more kids, and we can't stay in our apartment. You know, when we think about the future, what's our plan? I say this all the time. It's to give. And so I thought, man, for us as a church to activate something for our future, because I've seen the miracles again and again and again. I could sit here. Maybe I will sit here and tell you some stories. Like our house that we moved into and purchased for half price. That doesn't happen in Pismo Beach. Our mortgage for, uh, to own a home is less than what we paid in rent in a smaller place in the Rio Grande Village. That doesn't happen in Rio Grande in Pismo Beach. Can I get an amen? It happens over and over. And Lene and I just made this decision when we were, before we were even married. We said, wherever we live, God, hear us. Wherever we live, we want it to serve us and we want to feel blessed by it. I, I'm not going to serve my mortgage, God. I, I don't care. I'm just, that's never going to be me. I'm not going to do it. So you're going to have to provide. We started to give and give and give. And Lord, the Lord has provided. And so I'm excited as we activate this principle uh, as a whole, as our church, we're walking into that season of supernatural provision. Amen. You weren't excited about there? Three quick points. How many like three quick points? Come on. You guys ready? Say, what's point number one? Mm. Why does this generosity matter? Who is it for? Firstly, it's for you. Oh, too far. We're lagging. Oh, there it is. Nope. Oh, you got a slide. For you. <clears throat> Look, when it comes to being generous, we, we have this scripture. We, can, we go there now. Mark chapter 12, verse 30 and 31. We, we've all heard it, right? And if you haven't, I apologize for assuming you have. I'll read it. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. 
The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. And I was convicted one day. I thought, I feel like I love people. I feel like I smile at them. I feel like I open doors for people. I feel like I, I, I love people. But then the Lord challenged me, like, do you love them to the extent of treating their dreams like your dreams? Like your pursuits in life. Your desire for maybe for you it's the American dream. Maybe for you it's a job position. Maybe for you it, it, it is a house and a car and whatever it may be. Like, do you treat your neighbor as yourself in your desire to see them flourish in the way that you desire for your life to flourish? It's kind of a challenge. So I thought, that's going to interrupt my future plans, God. <laughs> that's going to cause me to actually sacrifice before he gives me the provision. That means that I'm actually going to have to dig a little bit before I start reaping a little bit. Hello, Kathy Rucker. Where are you at? Why are you not sitting right here? There you are. Hi. <laughs> um, love your neighbor as yourself. And so ultimately, generosity is for you. You first. You first. I, I hope that you flourish. And, and I believe that God has enough that w- where we all can flourish. Amen? I, I hope that it's said of our church that we celebrate others in their success. That we aren't jealous. That we actually consider God to be abundant in his resource and what he has for our lives. When we see other churches growing, we celebrate. Man, that's awesome. Come on, can we celebrate other churches growing? That's awesome. Come on, there's not enough room in this building for what God wants to do on the Central Coast. Bless them. When other people get recognition, uh, we bless them. God, expand their territory. Give them influence. Please, God, we, we celebrate. We bless them because our hearts are for you. Our hearts are for you. And that's how we're generous. It, going on, the second reason, it's for me. And I, I want to reference back to what I was talking about, activating that principle that doesn't re, re, like really expect anything from you on a flesh level, but actually re, it, it expects something he, from heaven. Why is generosity so important? Because it, it's really for me as well. And there's been this poverty mindset in the church for so long that, that we can't ever walk in, in abundance. And again, don't go back to the 80s and the word of faith and the trucks full of clothes and Benny Hinn. And uh, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, that's, not our, that's not our frame of reference. We're talking about God just causing us to flourish in whatever we're called to do. At the beginning of the year, I, I, I felt this. I was sitting with someone uh, who had lost their job after a long time working for a company. And they're in this season of life where it's going to be very difficult to get positioned the same way they were. And this individual was full of gifts and talents and passions and you know, being in the, maybe towards the evening of their life, their dreams were as, as if it was the morning of their life. And I believe that was intentionally from God because they have so much more in the season coming that they've ever had before. And, and, and they were considering what's, what's the next move? How does this all going to play out? And I just feel like it really was a word at that coffee table. I, I, I said, I believe God wants to give his people everything they need to be everything he's called them to be. Come on. I believe God wants to give his people everything they need to be everything he's called them to be. In Matthew chapter 6, it says this, No one can serve two masters. Either you hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. What you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any of you, by worrying at a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about your clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, how is which is here today, and tomorrow is thrown in the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom, 
and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Where have we seen righteousness before? Melchizedek. Seek first his kingdom and sow into things that are above you. (laughs) Sow into righteousness. For us in that context, sow into local church plants. That in turn you would be considered righteous, if you can track with me there. Because in Psalm 103 it says, Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. <laughs> Look, this is a challenge for some people. It's been a challenge for me, but my wife has taught me. How many of your wife is the best teacher in your home? Come on, somebody. And some of you just said, aside from the Holy Spirit, she is the Holy Spirit, guys. Come on. <laughs> if there's anyone more in tune, show me. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Just got nudged. Um, that because I'm a Christian, there are benefits. And we joke. We, we joke about things. Um, about we, we use this word, like if the, the last drink is in the fridge, and this is dumb, it's really dumb. Ready? But this is what we do as a joke, as a joke, people. And if I get the last drink in the fridge, I'll say, pastor's privileges. <laughs> Stupid, huh? So we joke about it. You know, we joke about it. We're not like that at all. But the reality is, is that Christians have privileges. Christians are in communion and connection and are taken care of by a father who is in heaven, who gives good gifts to his children. And he set in motion principles from centuries ago, thousands of years ago, that when you give, you will reap. Am I getting this point across okay this morning? I'm going to repeat myself till the cows come home. Forget not all his benefits. So generosity is for you. It's also for me. That I can have everything I need that, to be everything God's called me to be. Money is your servant. You know that? You don't serve money. Money is your servant. If there's a dream in your heart, money's going to serve the dream until it's accomplished. Amen? Can we just speak into that for a moment? Would anybody be so bold? We're going to, Jess, maybe you could come and. We can actually wrap up pretty soon here, but um, is, is there anybody who deals with that, like this idea that you're just on the grind, and if God ever gave you a dream above your current circumstance, like how, how would that work itself out? Is there anybody, would you stand with me? Because I'm that way as well. I get real logical, and I just think, man, there's things that limit the dream in my heart, and I just want to prophesy over this room and declare that that's broken off of your life. That money is your servant. Whatever, I remember when Lou Engle stood on this platform, he said, God will never tie your heart to a dead-end dream. He'll never try, tie your soul to a dead-end dream. And so I just want to release that over our church, that, that God would expand our capacity to trust Him, to believe in. And so, again, if, if you're comfortable with hands open wide, just standing before your Father, God, I ask that you would break off the mentality, the mindset that would ever limit your resource. Right now, we, we put money in its proper place as a servant. And we repent if we've ever served it. And we declare that resource, money, accumulation, that its purpose in this house and in the houses represented here are to serve the purposes of God. It's not vice versa. We cannot serve two masters. We cannot serve two masters. We cannot serve two masters. Money, you are our servant. And money, you will make a way. If anyone has a, a dream in their heart right now, I even I, 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 I'm just sensing in this moment, uh, and again, it has to do with books, that someone has this idea to write books But you know that takes a lot of time, and time is money. (laughs) Can I say to you who has a dream in your heart to write books, money is your servant. 
God's going to provide in ways where you can take days on end to sit down and write. God's going to provide for you in ways that are going to bypass the typical publishing system. He's going to put you in partnership with people who believe in your project, in the finances that it typically requires to publish books. Not so with you. Money's your servant. In Jesus' name. Someone else has the desire. You have a family member that is in a critical condition medically, a chronic condition that has left them dependent on resources uh, that the government provides, but you know that what the government is providing right now isn't enough, and the desire in your heart is to supplement that. But you look at your own finances, and you think, how can I be a resource to them? But I prophesy to your situation and say money is your servant. I, I, I speak to that dream in your heart to lend a helping hand to your family member. God, I ask that you would pour out a blessing. Open the heavens. Pour out a blessing that we cannot contain. And Lord, I thank you that whoever you are in this room, that that's your desire. That God is going to give you the desire of your heart. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Come on, can you just rest in his presence? For those looking for jobs, <laughs> we ask God that you would open doors that no man could shut right now in Jesus' name. Resumes are floating to the top of piles right now in Jesus' name. God, you're blinding the eyes of management to other options in Jesus' name. God, you are changing the status quo in corporations on who they hire because there's people in this room that need a job and they need to be positioned not just for money's sake, but for kingdom's sake. So we thank you for opening those doors in Jesus' name. And would you repeat this after me? Just real simple. Would you repeat this after me? Money is my servant. Amen. You can have a seat. We're going to keep going. Jess, you can stay. That's fine. I feel like it's just better when Jessica's here. Would you agree? The atmosphere. What would Benny do? <laughs> mm. Hallelujah. I never heard of Benny Hinn message in my whole life until after I had dinner with him. It's interesting. Number three, why does generosity matter? Who's generosity for? It's for us. Simple. Let this scripture wreck your life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. When our father had a desire to see the world reconciled to himself, what method did he use? Giving. He thought, how do I capture the hearts of humanity? <laughs> how do I get my kids back? I'll give. I'll give. He was in the position where he didn't have to do that, you know. <laughs> I mean, he's God creator of heaven and the earth. In Job, it says, if he withdrew his breath for one second, we'd all return to dust. How do I get my kids back? How do I reconcile the world to myself? I give. I'm going to give. And I'm not just going to give something that's logical. <laughs> I'm not just going to give them uh, a code book or a way or a treasure map to find their way back to me because that's within my means to do something like that. Oh, I'm going to give the thing that's most precious to me so that they know the full extent of my love. For God so loved the world that he gave. Look, I love the world. Don't you? I love the world. 
I love the world. I love people. My heart and my desire, our church's heart and our church's desire is that no one would perish. No one deserves that, man. We so love the world that we give. We so love the world that we change our lifestyle and our personal preference so that other people can live. <laughs> it's the way of the kingdom. Generosity. It's God's method of reconciling the world to himself. Not only that, how beautiful is it to be around other people who have embraced a lifestyle of generosity when the rest of the world is just dying in their efforts to accumulate. To protect mine. To protect my kingdom. <laughs> to make sure that I'm always one step ahead. To make sure that I have the better plan. To make sure that I have the better car and the house and the... Like, so when we get in conversation, I will, I'll, I'll one-up you for sure. <laughs> like, that's people's motivation in life. <laughs> How awesome is it to be of a different spirit? To be like Melchizedek who welcomed Abraham in and gave him food and wine. And he blessed him. You know that that's the only blessing in Genesis. That's the first Hebrew blessing in the Bible. And the response to it was radical generosity. Radical generosity. He didn't owe him anything, but he gave. So who's generosity for? Why does it matter? It's for us, for all of us. Can I read that scripture one more time? Can you read it with me? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Amen. Amen. Well, I pray that you are feeling encouraged, inspired, and equipped to take on whatever you may be facing in this life. And hey, why don't you consider joining us? We meet every Sunday at the Clark Center in Arroyo Grande at 10 a.m., and it's always a good time. We'd love to have you with us. And for any more information, ways you can partner with us, please visit EquipperCC.com. God bless.